dropped out of the ocean in the first place. And because this topic is a, an oft-requested lesson in evolutionary studies, I expect that it will likely be shared with some of the folks who don't understand or accept evolution, probably because they've only been told wrong things about it, like that it's supposed to be one kind of thing turning into giving birth to another fundamentally different kind of thing. But none of that is right. That's not how it works at all. So in this video, I'll try to keep it clear and simple and present this in such a way that anyone who wants to will be able to understand it. Evolution is the one and only explanation of biodiversity, summarily defined as varying allele frequencies in reproductive populations over successive generations, where particular traits of some varieties may be artificially or naturally selected. This applies to diversity within a species and to the origin of species, as well as myriad levels of common ancestry, uh, microbes to men, all of it. The same exact processes and mechanisms are ongoing continuously throughout every level. And evolution at every level is a series of incremental, usually subtle, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities which are how we identify taxonomic clades or categories. What you may have heard of originally as the old Linnaean ranks of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. That's how it was for a couple centuries, but it's much more detailed and finely defined now. And we're not talking about individuals either. This is not when Bob the fish decides to grow legs so that he can go take a walk on land. No. You know, we're talking about an accumulation of subtle changes in emerging groups over long periods of time, where in one original tribe, we eventually noticed that, that everyone in this quadrant or this cluster now shares a suite of traits that are not held in common with any of the rest of them. So everything the science deniers say about evolution is completely wrong. A better way to understand it is as a matter of population genetics in which minor mutations occur regularly uh, and each local collective continues to build up their own unique mutations growing further and further apart or becoming increasingly distinct from their ancestors or cousins such that the crown of every taxonomic clade is the one original form that produces two or more daughter sets that are still the same basic thing as their ancestors were. They didn't become something fundamentally different, just superficially so, enough that you can tell the sister sets apart. Thus, if you have a given population divided into two separate groups isolated by some natural boundary, for example, then after a few centuries or so, if, uh, if you find a lone wanderer in the no man's land between these two separated tribes, you'll probably be able to tell just by looking at it which group it came from. And while mutations are accrued constantly, they tend to be absorbed and negated again by the interbreeding, especially given a large gene pool. The smaller the group, in reproductive isolation, the more likely that genetic variants, novel genetic variants, will have a chance to be expressed. Most mutations also tend to be slight, trivial, so they don't have any impact on natural selection, but they still lead to myriad forms and colors, a wider variety of whatever that you started with. Uh, detrimental mutations occur too, but they tend to get weeded out very quickly, while beneficial mutations tend to win out as if, if they aid at all in survival or reproduction. So there's a selective pressure to keep that feature, meaning that over the course of population mechanics over time, there is a higher probability that this trait will be preserved and maybe even enhanced. Then each of these daughter groups go on to produce another two or more subsets, and they continue to diversify indefinitely until you know one lineage goes extinct. And the more diverse they are, the more likely they are that some lineage will survive. This is how we get biodiversity, through descent with inherent modification. So every new taxa that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were, and they still belong to every parent clade that their forerunners did. And this is how we can eventually get from something that looks like a reptile to something that looks more mammalian. Most of the things on this tree, for example, look like mammals, but they're not quite true or complete mammals yet. All except for the top one, of course. The next thing to realize is that biodiversity can't be exponential all the time. Uh, some of these groups will eventually die out. In fact, every single one of these categories is now extinct. All of them, except for mammals, the true mammal. But then when you open that clade or category, we see another branching explosion of biodiversity, which you'd expect because there are a lot of mammals alive today, right? Except that this is the diversity 
of Mesozoic mammals. These are the mammals that lived alongside the dinosaurs. And not even the recent ones, like T. rex and that, but twice that old, well over 120 million years ago. These were very different than what we have today. You would not confuse any of these with any mammal you've ever seen alive. And again, every one of these categories is now entirely extinct, except for two groups. First, let's look at the monotremes. There are two taxonomic families. Uh, one includes four genera of echidna, accounting for seven surviving species. The other family has only one genus and one species, and that's the platypus, the only one left of their lineage. Even though monotremes are egg layers, they're still mammals because they're warm-blooded, albeit just barely. Their body temperature is lower than that of all other mammals. And they produce milk, but not like we do. They don't have teats, nipples. Instead, they sort of sweat the milk out of pores that the babies have to lap up. That's the defining characteristic of mammals, that they have mammaries, the glands that produce milk, not that they necessarily have to give live birth. Collectively, monotremes are the sole survivors of egg-laying mammals. All these others, every single one on this list, they were all egg-laying mammals, all except for some of the survivors of this one highlighted group, Cladotheria. The definitive characteristic of this group is the, their ears, where some other mammal groups had a hole in the side of their head with a bit of a curve in the cochlear canal. Cladotheres had a complete coil of 270 degrees. Remember that because it'll be important later. And this is a good example of how incremental evolution is. You start with all the traits that defined each of these parent clades, and then you add a new feature, or you lose one, or, or more accurately, some part of it just changes proportion a bit so that it works differently. When we look into Cladotheria, again, we see another branching tree of two daughters becoming four, and then eight, and 16, and so on, excepting for the ones that go extinct before they can branch out anymore. Every descendant group forms its own clade. And again, every one of these listed clades is extinct now, all except for that last one. If we look at Zatharia, a subset of Cladotheria, members of this group are usually born entirely toothless, which is just one line of evidence indicating that by this point in their evolution, they finally had nipples as a focal point of the lactating glands. So now they can suckle the milk instead of having to lap it up. Then, one of the subsets of Zatharia, Tribos finita, shows that by this time, mammals no longer had a cloaca. Reptiles, including birds, defecate, urinate, and procreate all out of the same hole. Uh, so do monotremes, that's why they're called that. But in the more advanced mammals, the anus had become a separate channel from the urethra and vagina. And that's a necessary prerequisite for the next stage, or clade, theria because this is the point at which mammals are exclusively viviparous, giving live birth instead of laying eggs. And geneticists have identified a number of ancestral defects, different ones, that lead to live birth in both of these subgroups. And let's look at those. Now first, check out metatheria. That includes marsupials, along with all these other things. Now remember that every one of these, like all of those other categories we saw before, are only known from fossils. All the way at the bottom, we find marsupials, the one category that includes kangaroos and koalas, wombats and possums, and a bunch of other things, including some impressive fossil forms, all in this one category, while everything else, all these other groups of mammals are now entirely extinct. All that we've seen so far should illustrate why paleontologists say that everything we still have, all the species that are alive today, represent only about 1% of everything that has ever lived. That the fossil record reveals way more things have come and gone before us than we still have around with us. And if you look at the other subset, eutheria, often conflated with placental mammals, this one category includes every mammal you've ever heard of, apart from marsupials and monotremes. That's bats, rats, cats, cattle, swine and rhinos, aardvarks, armadillos, manatees, mandrels, and man. Every placental mammal you've ever heard of, all in this one category. But importantly, None of those species yet existed when this category began. When what would be the common ancestor of all these modern mammals lived way back in the time of the dinosaurs, they were already myriad mammals of other varieties that no one has ever seen alive. Although most of them, I got to admit, looked about the same. Now, to begin with, none of them were very big. Better to go unnoticed among the dinosaurs than to try to compete with them, because dinosaurs processed oxygen more efficiently than we mammals do. So pound for pound, they were faster, stronger, and had more endurance than we do, too. So better to stay small and hard to get to. The most primitive form of marsupial looked a bit like an American opossum. 
and the most primitive form of eutherian mammal looks a bit like a shrew, and they both look a lot like each other, meaning that if you have, you have the streamlined form with the pointy nose at the front and the long tail at the back, um, they look a lot like rats or mice, except that they still have five toes on each foot. And instead of having oversized incisors like a rodent, they have elongated canines like a carnivore. So this is the base, the template form for all modern mammals. And the further back in time you look, the more similar related forms will be. The difference between them is mostly developmental. Placental mammals are, of course, born in placenta. So that separates things that look like shrews from things that are more like possums. And so it continues, leaving the metatherians behind, like we did with the monotremes, we continue through placental mammals. Genetically, we see that all extant eutherians fall into one of two basic groups. On the one side, we, let's say the southern side, we have Atlanta genata, which divides into two daughter groups, again, the way evolutionary diversity typically does. This time it follows the division of Africa from South America as they move apart in their tectonic plates. Because they used to be joined together, and as they moved apart, this group was divided into two continents with the formation of the Atlantic Ocean coming between them, thus the name Atlanta Genata. On the one side of that, we have Afrotherians, the African mammals. That's hyrax, elephants, sirenians, and a number of fascinating fossil forms. Then on the other side, the other side of the Atlantic, we have Xenarthra, the South American mammals, anteaters, sloths, armadillos, and all their oversized ancestors. I should do video phylogenies on both of the groups of Atlanta genata, and I probably will, but at another time. All of them, both sides of this tree, share a mutation such that the testes never descend out of the body like they still do in the other group, Boreo eutheria. Well, there are a couple of exceptions, which we'll see momentarily. So again, the earliest members of either of these groups looked a lot like shrews, being the most primitive form of all eutherian mammals. It's just that one of these had visibly descended scrotum, where the other ones never dropped. Well, I chose to use an elephant shrew to represent the odd one, but I really should mention that, that just because we call it a shrew doesn't mean it's really a shrew. It's just one of many things that looked like shrews. And they use modern species for illustrative purposes, but that doesn't mean that either of these were around 160 million years ago. But this was. And although this is not a shrew, it, it is a different species than what we have today. It does superficially look like a shrew, doesn't it? The next evolutionary division in this tree is just as subtle as the last one we mentioned. Eurocontagliers are the undifferentiated combination of archontids and gliers, while Laurasiatherians are the mammals of Laurasia, which is the supercontinent of Eurasia back when it was still connected to North America too. These are the northern hemisphere mammals. Eurocontagliers come from there too, but that's our 